Okay. What is that That's sound great. effect? That's my. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Give me like 48 hours and I just, someone needs to talk me off the ledge. Otherwise it's coming off. It's, the fuck it's, is we're wrong going with down you this morning. We're going down Get to it like together buzzing to like a number two for real. I think about that all the time. Every day. Just, yeah, every, every day. Just take it off. Hey friends, welcome to the Separated at Birth podcast with your hosts, Katie Martin and Karen Burke Brown. This is the podcast where we find alignment in the most unlikely places, proving that lightning can strike anywhere at any time. We're weave together a world of middle age empowerment as single moms, businesswomen, and creatives. Finding alignment, navigating relationships after divorce, raising kids, building businesses in the creative space, and doing the hard work of unearthing our very best selves in the process and having a lot of mother effing opinions about it. We're so stoked to have you here. So let's go. Let's get into the episode. Okay, yeah. Susan Guidi joins us today on the Separated Birth <laughs> Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. So excited well, to have um, her here. Sorry. A Tampa, Good Florida afternoon. native. She's a business owner. She's a bodybuilder. She's an improv comic. She is all the things. And we are just so pleased and excited to have her here with us today. She's she's joining from sorry. Tampa. Anger. She's lived abroad. She's pioneered ultrasounds in in South America. She got her degree at Johns Hopkins University and has taught. She lived in Paris for a year um, and basically just has, you know, kicked ass and taken names her entire life. So we're so stoked to have you here today to kind of unpack a little bit of her story. We want to get into, you know, our our typical topics, which are relationships and sort of surviving relationships, surviving some of the toxic relationships, but also championing the best relationships that we have in our lives, which may or may not include our partners or our best friends or what have you. Um, she's a mom, she's a grandmother, and Susan, I'm so, so thrilled to have you today. I'm so excited, I know you're gonna entertain us, and just, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be able to get in the weeds in a lot of this stuff, so we're so thrilled to have you. Susan, will Thank you just you. kind of unpack a little bit of your story, just kind of introduce yourself, where you're from, you know, kind so, of what you're about, and, and then we'll kind of get into some juicy yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'll do my two-minute sort of pitch here. Um, from Cuban Catholic from Tampa, Florida. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. My very American from upstate New York father married a Cuban woman he met in Tampa, and as soon as they were married, he went to mortuary science school in wow. Cincinnati, Ohio. He was going to be a funeral director. Mm -hmm. My mother was pregnant with me. Six months later, he finished mortuary science, that's hard to say, school, and we moved back to Tampa where I grew up. Uh, grew up, I'm 67 years old, so I grew up in the early 60s. And I have to say, we were a very modest income. My father was a funeral director and my mother worked outside the home. Uh, she had three girls and it was idyllic. I was a tomboy. I was madly in love with my father and a very tough, tough, harsh mom. Mm -hmm. But that made me be like him. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do everything. I was the firstborn that that man did. So he was a talented musician. Oh, wow. So from the time I could remember, he taught me piano. Mm -hmm. And we listened to Barbara Streisand. And he would travel away in a traveling harmonica band. He played on Ed Sullivan, for those of us who are old enough. Wow. Oh, wow. To That's know fantastic. Who Ed Sullivan is. So that is cool. His sort of, you know, he was of that generation. They didn't get to say, fuck it, and I'm going after my dreams. Mm -hmm. He had to be in this job, right? Yeah. Which he hated sort of in the end. Oh. And I grew up in a funeral home. Yeah. I have, I have a girlfriend whose dad was a funeral director and she's like, yeah, I used to go downstairs in the basement and like play with all the equipment and like lay in the coffins that were unused and like <laughs> just, 
you know, it was like a, the it bodies. Was, it was a play. It was like oh, wow. where they played as kids. They were like, you know, embalming. You don't know my any dad, different. I, and, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. And in those days, my dad was a two pack a day Paul Mall smoker. Oh, shit. Wow. Right? He also did a hundred. He was the first Renaissance man. He would do jigsaw because like he was a craft person. He was always in the creative. So we yeah. have a jigsaw machine in the embalming room smoking, <laughs> right? And I'd walk in and go, Daddy, what you doing? Yeah. And there'd be an open body there. And I'd just go, can I poke it? Can I touch it? Wow. I practiced the organ in the reception room with the dead body at the head of the room. I played Barbies there. Wow. So Barbie never finds out about that. <laughs> you know, this dead is so... Barbie. She'll be pissed. I'm just, I'm, my head is spinning. <laughs> My head is spinning. I mean, what a childhood. And then did your sisters, you had two sisters? Two sisters. Did they, did they also kind of fall into that creative, like, vein? We did they, all Did they adore your so dad, my too? my mother was very jealous and very critical. And mm. she became jealous of her oldest daughter. Yeah. Which is a big mistake in the parenting manual, okay? Don't be jealous of your I would venture to guess that would be problematic, yes. Mm -hmm. You know? And... It made me gravitate to my dad, but my dad was charismatic and fun and he was a musician. And so she was always sure he was cheating on her, right? And he would travel for these musical gigs. Finally, she screamed at him one night at the table and said, can't you just teach the kids how to play? <laughs> oh my gosh. And I, I heard imagine. it and I thought, I can do this. I'll mm. be his first I'll be his lead harmonica player. Yeah. And we started a family harmonica band. Oh my gosh. We wow. traveled the you United know, States. I saw harmonica, a video that on your fantastic. page during oh. your one woman show that you've done and you do play the harmonica in it. No, I play it. It's incredible. She's, She's like, right let me get it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, I I love it. It. That's amazing. <laughs> what a story. Oh, wow. that's what it was. And, you know, so all of this, I realize now in my mid 60s are my superpowers. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because all of this sort of young girl with rose colored glasses with a father who loved her, who was creative, but a mother who was not kind. Fast mm. forward to I. You know, I wanted to go to medical school. It was 1975. There was an economic crisis. Do you think that I, because your dad was a funeral director, you had a sort of a, a kind of an uh, obsession with the human body? Yeah. No, and, and then not that so much an obsession. My dad made a bet to the other. So funeral homes in those days were part-time ambulance services. So if oh, you I lived in a that. small community like we did, if there was an ambulance call. The ambulances lived on residents and they were paramedics. Mm -hmm. So they had to know advanced CPR. They had to know everything, right? Mm -hmm. Smoking two packs a day, right? <laughs> and don't do what we do, kids. Yes. Do exactly. As Not as I do. And <laughs> one day he made a bet with the other guys who worked in the funeral home and he said they had to take the advanced CPR. He goes, I'm going to teach my two little girls and I bet they'll make higher grades than you were. And we were like, seven and nine wow and he spent months teaching us every, every bone in the body every muscle and god sorry bless it that's okay he's excited about that um <laughs> you know you said bones <laughs> we passed the test yes exactly i've got bones um good one <laughs> you never know what i'm gonna say I yeah know. Yes. I'll be here all week, ladies. She's so, she's so quick. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be. But anyway, long story short, we just had the most idyllic, you know, childhood growing up. We started this harmonica band. My mother made all the costumes. We traveled all over the country. We fast forward to college. I'm supposed to go to medical school. That falls through. And I get into something called nuclear medicine school. And that was unheard of as well. Like, mm -hmm. I literally am like the Marie Curie of ultrasound because wow. I am telling you that I've lived long enough that when I started an ultrasound, it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And and was it just you and a bunch of dudes too? No, With there was women? a world of people. There okay. just wasn't anybody. 
in Ho Dunk, Florida. Yeah. So I had to sort of teach myself. And then as I would scan, I would take them to the radiologist to say, hey, look what I'm doing. They go, oh, that's worthless. So the very doctors that I worked with would say, you can't do that. And wow. I realized that most of my life was beginning this adventure of the more you told me I couldn't. Right, right. The more you're like, the more oh, really? I was watch me. Say, <laughs> you know, watch me. Yeah. Right? And I was such an outlier. My mother gave me a silver front tooth in my, my, when year you were a kid. I broke my tooth because I was a tomboy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because she was so cheap. She said, oh, yeah, we'll take the silver. I look like a <laughs> pirate. <laughs> <laughs> Three more years of high school. If you don't think you develop a warrior oh, right. mindset oh my God. with that. Right. Oh, yeah. You learn how to smile real quick. Like You yeah. don't smile. If yeah. you look back, these yeah. are like my pictures. But but now you can say, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. That was preparing me. Yeah. There right. was more to come. Yeah. Right. That's, it's, that's incredible. It's, so then you yeah. go from, you graduate. Tell me about like your 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 career I, journey and then how that maybe collided with your personal life. So I go to nuclear medicine school. The only job that was available when I graduated here in Tampa was in West Palm Beach. So I moved like a young single girl, in my early 20s to West Palm. And I did speak Spanish. So I mm -hmm. was always considered sort of Latina in a way, even though mm -hmm. I don't look it. And I started scanning. And the doctors didn't appreciate anything I was doing. So I'd go back downstairs, scan some more. One day I diagnosed an elderly gentleman, something called an aortic aneurysm. And I saved his life because they hadn't seen it. Wow. And mm -hmm. they said, now we're going to hire a real sonographer. And to Ugh. pacify me, they said, we're going to send you to this course at Johns Hopkins. You know, like to... Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Get out of and here, that kid. Was the beginning. <laughs> let of... the adults do the work. Let the let the dudes who oh, are so practicing medicine, yeah. Go to Johns Hopkins for a week, and when I tell you I was thirsty, I guess that's what the young kids said. <laughs> I was thirsty. I emptied waste baskets. I did everything while I was there. And at the end of the week, the head of the department, one of the gods of ultrasound, he was British. He was like, "Would you like a job here?" And he looked like Einstein. He was like all crazy looking, <laughs> wrinkled lab coat. Oh, geez. And I yeah. remember going, are, me? are you talking to me? Yeah. Six weeks later, I was in Baltimore. I left everything in Tampa. My parents couldn't even help me move my shit. Oh, wow. God. Look at, that's amazing. And went to and, Hopkins And how old are you at 80s, this time? Uh, 21 and a half. 21 and wow. a half. Wow. Okay. A baby. Be. Yeah. yeah, baby. Yeah, in Baltimore. Mm. And then I moved to Baltimore, and they think I'm the most Latina person they've ever met. <laughs> ever laid eyes on. Absolutely. So they like, would call you're me to so translate. Exotic. Oh, you wow. know, and I go to like X-ray, and they'd say, "Hey, can you translate this barium enema?" Right. And I remember thinking, I don't have a lot of medical terms in Spanish, so I'm just going to use the ones I know. And if I don't know them, I'll put O and A's at the end of every word I tell. <laughs> Like so I speak Spanish. 17-year-old <laughs> kid with big brown eyes from some Latin American country. And he's having a procedure where we have to put a tube in their ass yeah. and pump them full of bar It's barbaric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. I have to translate that. So I end up telling him that we literally are going to put a tube up his <laughs> ass and put some white stuff up there. <laughs> He's like, uh, no, ma'am. And he's 17? He's like, get the fuck out of here? No, I think someone came in and rescued me and said, it's not exactly like that. It's not quite that. But I got a reputation. Like, it's for Spanglish, sp okay? For Spanish. Oh, my God. And there came this chance from the universe to teach ultrasound for the first time in Chile with a medical missionary that had gone once before oh, fun. and wanted a sonographer. Mm -hmm. And I went, I'll go. I didn't know where Chile was. Mm -mm. I had to look on those big old atlases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, there we are. And how long and were you there? 
So the first time I was there for a week, I thought I was a rock star. And I met my former husband. Yeah. He was a doctor in the class I was teaching. Was, they had he, news was he from Chile or was he Yeah, from, he's was... French and Chilean. Okay. Wow. Okay. So he wow. was suave. Exotic. And and oh, yeah. Dare, charismatic. Oh, he yeah. was. Baby girl was, was a long way from home and. 20 something. She's what like, I told you. Somebody too. I go, <laughs> yeah. I had to go 3,000 miles to meet someone. Yeah. And then the next year I got invited back, but probably because of this relationship, mm. um, to be on sabbatical. Mm -hmm. And we got married at the end of six months. And he was French. And he wanted to come to the States, but he couldn't get in. Because in those days, remember, there was no, com you know, I can't even believe we're saying no computer. So if you took right. entrance exams, they were given once a year oh, and yeah. you had to like fly to the United States. Uh -huh. So he got into France and off we go to Paris. Yeah. Oh, and wow. I get pregnant literally two months later because I remember he was five years older than me and him telling me, You're not he had an accent as well. I married my mother, essentially. <laughs> um, oh, God. She could relate. Oh, yeah. You know? I married my mother and he had a strong accent and he would say, you're at the perfect age to be pregnant. Oh. Like, oh, well, let's inseminate me. Come on, yeah. let's go. <laughs> right? That feels very Jeez. clinical. Right. And then I was lost for the first time. Here I was, this young girl who had gone to South America and all these cool things. I go to Paris and I can't work. The Parisians are mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you I don't speak the language. <laughs> I married again. Isn't that an interesting, like, like a, a mindset shift too? Just here's this girl that's like, go, 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 taking on every adventure, throwing caution to the wind. Yes, I'll go here. Yes, I'll go there. And following your instincts, right? And, and allowing goodness to flow to you. And suddenly it's like, the guillotine drops on you. Oh, what a and great everything term! Everything <laughs> right, in guillotine. your mindset went from this grand adventure uh, that is life, and that you've got the world by the balls, and now it's got you by the balls. I would imagine it feels like you're out of control, where you were like, "I'm yeah. calling my own shots." And now you're boom, like, now you're like I'm, I'm far from home," yeah. you know. And there's just a, a mindset. And he a was. Baby. It was the beginning too. Remember, my generation is of the men that the men got to go away. Yeah. The men got to go and be famous. The men got to be a doctor for 12 hours in a country where he was beautiful and charismatic and he spoke fluent French. And he's gone for 12, 14 hours a day and I'm all by yeah. myself. And there's no TV, there's no computer. I'm writing letters to make a phone call. People, I mean, this is in my lifetime, to make a phone call would have cost you half your rent. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember, yeah. You know? Yeah. So you couldn't call. And then I remember sitting around and going, I need to call home. Like I need to call Johns Hopkins because I can't spend How this year isolating. doing nothing. So yeah. I enrolled, I, they introduced me to a professor at the University of Marie and Curie, uh, Pierre Curie in mm -hmm. Paris and Monsieur Panichel. And he was this rotund, he looked like a character out of Disney, oh. you know? Yeah, like a just a rotund in a black suit. He wore the same fat, bl fat, <laughs> <It was> fat. <laughs> round black suit every day. He had dandruff. Rotund also clothes. means fat. It's fine. <laughs> it's round. He's round, <laughs> like a weeble wobble. That's what you're describing. Is exactly. what I'm thinking. He was yeah. so what, but he was he was he carrying a big fat me. tire with him all day long. <laughs> but he loved me. He spoke like 17 languages. Oh, wow. And wow. he did research on the placenta on baboon. So he would travel oh, wow. with just pygmies and him and uh, quinine and go into the, you know, whatever jungles to study placenta of yeah. baboons. Wow. And when he realized that I could scan with ultrasound, he said, Madame Guidi, we are going to do a project together. You will get your master's degree and you, we will work every day together. And then you will write your thesis. And I said, okay. Yes. And I remember telling my ex-husband, I'm going to get my master's degree because you're not going to be able to do this. I remember us crossing the courtyard of the university and I thought, I have something to do. Yeah, you had this Give purpose. You a purpose. Yeah, yeah, right. Outside of, because you had a baby, me, right? Or no? Did you have a baby no, at the time? No, I was pregnant. Okay. 
You okay. were pregnant. So All right. So you went from like bored to tears, not knowing what to do with yourself, to suddenly being able to funnel your energy back toward this beautiful purpose. Well, it's again. like all of a sudden we're going to do this project, and someone's going to see me, and they're going to validate my knowledge. And you are just a baby knowledge. maker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, what happened quickly though was that I was supposed to scan placentas. Well, you know what happens in Paris? They don't give you the placentas because they use them for beauty products. Yes. Mm. Isn't that crazy? I was going to ask you So you, you about couldn't that. scan them. So I mm-hmm. called Hopkins and they said, come home. We'll give you your own placental pathologist. You can do all the research here. You can use all the machines. And I thought I can get one of my friends who was an obstetrician to see me. Mm-hmm. So I went back home by myself for probably eight weeks. Dang. And did all the research. And it was amazing mm. i bet that and freedom he, was glorious at that time you know feeling just, oh. you you started that way and then got kind of and stifled did you, and did then you feel like i don't see my husband anyway he's gone 14 hours a day so who gives a shit Wh- just where was i am beginning to be this sort of thing there mm. was just a thing you know there was just a thing and Meaning, meaning say, like you were living sort of these separate existences, even I though you were I remember thinking I was Princess Diana. Does mm. that? Mm. My hair just stood up on my head. And yeah. I got married Trapped. at the same time mm-hmm. in the same mm-hmm. month mm-hmm. as her. Wow. Mm-hmm. I watched from Chile the wedding. Yeah. And mm. I felt so aligned with her because I kept thinking... I, I can I empathize that. with the lone, whatever that absence mm-hmm. is, that void. But he was perfect. He could right. cook better than me. He could sew better than me. One day, here's an example. We were very poor. And I decided that I would not buy anything, that I would make my own pregnancy outfits. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> so one afternoon... I sew all fucking day long. Oh, God. I'm so proud I've made baby sheets. I oh. am just... And we had no Pinterest, no nothing. Like, I'm yeah. just going by a pattern. Making it up as you go along. Yeah. By a pattern, right? Mm-hmm. And I hold up the dress in front of him as he comes home, and he goes, rip all of that out. You've done it wrong. And I went, how do you know? He goes, I made my own pants in medical school. So of course you did. <laughs> so, anyway... Just, I, I finish, I, five days before I deliver my first baby, I give my thesis, I graduate oh with honors. In yes, this, you do. Yes, you do. And we move back to the States. Now he gets to work at Hopkins, and I don't. We can't both work with a baby at my mm-hmm. alma mater or whatever. I have the baby, and then six months later, we move to Chile. And Chile's kind of idyllic until Pinochet was a dictator. Here I live in a mm-hmm. dictatorship. You know, we had state of emergencies and things like that. And we were pretty poor. And we realized we're going to move back to the States. Because yeah. we lived there for about three years and made nothing. He was a full-time radiologist. We were just... So we said, well, we're going to take a chance and come to the States. We moved to Tampa. And within six months of us moving here, one night he goes to the gym. We only had one car. Two babies under five, one car, me working 80 hours a week. I was teaching. I ran the local community college ultrasound program. So it was a nightmare. And he takes off one night to go to the gym. And he doesn't come back. It's like 7 o'clock, it's 8 o'clock, it's 9 o'clock. No phones, no cell phones. Sure, you can't. Nothing. I'm driving with my mother's car around Tampa like a maniac, thinking, is he going to be dead in the street? Like, how am I going to find him? And then... I come back home and like a half an hour later or something, he pops in kind of sheepish. And I realized shortly after that, that he had been seduced in the like steam rooms of the gym, but now with a woman. Oh boy. Oh boy. Hmm. With Hmm. a man. Hmm. Never and suspected anything before or never had any sort of inclination of... So I, when my daughters were in high school, I taught an introduction to young women's health and sexuality. And when we came to the point 
where we said, should you have sexual experience before you get married? I'm going to give a resounding yes, because I am telling you, I'm of the good girl generation, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't sleep with anybody before we got married. Right. Mm -hmm. You didn't test out anything. And I had no comparison. No gaydar either. No. I had none. Gotcha. He, he was my, he was perfect. He yeah. cleaned, he cooked, he dressed, You're like, he like, wait, <laughs> wait a second. We're a little too aren't we? Wait a second. Until we moved back to the States. Yeah. And guess what time in the United States it was? It was the peak of AIDS. Right, right. And there became the journey of the secret. Mm. I see. Because I realized I couldn't tell anyone mm -hmm. because they were stoning people in Florida mm. if you had AIDS. Oh my God. Wow. Oh my God. So here's, he's this doctor Ugh. and you know, we're this beautiful little family, you know, in our Sears portrait. I did make the mistake. And this is where the stand up comes in um, of telling my mother that we were having problems. And just to grow up in this mentality, this was what my mother said. I, you're having problems. You know what your problem is? You don't cook or clean enough. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. That but that was her. It. That'll make a man gay. Right. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're so you're that, that's just ignorance, you know, yeah. where it's. Oh, she loved him. No, she still yeah. loves him. She oh, still boy. loves him. So loves how long him. were you married to him in total? 20 years. And you won't, you had two children with him or three? No. Who? He got arrested as a good doctor will do. And I really thought that was going to be the end. And then we went to some counseling and I remember they, you know, in those days you could get arrested and everything was hidden. They would just quash the case and never to be heard of. There weren't any mugshots or mugshot.com, mm -hmm. nothing. Yeah. So he sort of got away with it. But in our counseling, the counselor looked at me and said, I've tested his IQ. He's a genius, but he's also a pathologic narcissist. You know? No way. But so, what did he get arrested for? Lewd and lascivious behavior. Oh, um, mm. wow. Yeah, because okay. he, he sort of, I think from the intellectualism was starting to seek out these activities that he could get away with. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure there were tons more. This mm -hmm. one, I just had an awareness. And then like a year later, we must have had sex once. And I swear to God, it's like the universe says, I'm going to give you this pregnancy <laughs> because this will save you for your journey moving forward. Mm. This baby, it's a lot to say that he's going to save me. He's going to help. It's going to help. Mm. There's and a so purpose. You had sex one time and you got pregnant from that. Yeah. Wow. And I must have ovulated when I, because I work in this. Yeah. I look back and I go, this must have been day seven, you yeah. know, in the cycle. Wow. So I really feel like, and that's how that. It's just divine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's yeah. divine. Yeah. Wow. And I, yeah. So you have three a, children. So I have three children. Um, two girls, both are married and that's, they make up seven grandchildren. And then my son, he is a third year medical resident. Um, and I do this motivational speaking and I talk a lot about him because when you raise a boy and you raise them by yourself, mm -hmm. oh, I, I, I don't think I've ever, I swear to God, he's like a little, you know, how, like, you know, angels came on earth mm -hmm. and he, we've never had words and he's funny mm. and he's musical and he's artistic and he was raised with three women, mm -hmm. you know, with this, what I call marinated in like maternal love. Wow. And he's just, he lived with me during the pandemic. That yeah. was the other cool thing. I said it was like living with Einstein. <laughs> so, so how old are your children now? Your your daughters and your son. Uh, forty one, um, thirty nine, and Jean Claude's thirty one. Thirty one, amazing, amazing. Yeah, now, is, great story. 
is your ex-husband, is he still around and is he still involved with the kids? And No, and you know, I will tell women that as we learn to start forgiving ourselves for stuff, right? And that's first and foremost. Um, you know, you have to look at them in a way that no longer sort of, I guess I picture myself as having like a defense shield around him. I don't think he's not a kind person. He's a t he's an awful person, right? But I, I really am still doing the work right now in this sort of, forgiveness, you mm -hmm. know, and not being triggered. Cause I used to say he's my kryptonite. There was just something about him and his partner and my mother that, you know, holy trinity or not so holy trinity of right. energy that wasn't great for me, you mm -hmm. know? So during the pandemic, I almost lost my son in Haiti. He went to Haiti and got stuck there. Oh gosh. And I said, I'm gonna at 60 something, I'm going to give something. I got him back and I said, I'm just going to be on a mission to be the best representative of this age and women understanding that there's no age that's too late. That if you look back at your youth, you've got superpowers that you developed. And then we find ourselves like little candles, having people just blowing out the candle, right? Or making us stay small or be silent. And my, I do the forgiveness prayer a lot for my ex-husband and his partner you know, mm. and I thank them because I'd never be who I am right now if I hadn't gone through that journey. I, Isn't that I, the I, shit <laughs> where, you yes. know, like it had to happen. This is why, but you're like, God, like, Damn would it. I change it? Would it, could I feel lighter had I not, you know, carried all of this stuff and having to go through the forgiveness every day and reminding yourself, these people don't define me. Like i I made my own path kind of thing. But then you're like, gosh, they were part of creating who you are now. So it's like that, like just damned if you, like you just, the struggle of accepting it and being like, fuck everyone. I'm just going to keep moving forward. Rage, you know, tamping that rage that, yeah, for it's, so long. it's hard because it's how, how do you, it, it's, it's always that deal that you make with yourself where it's like, this happened. I'm accepting it. I own it. I've got to keep moving forward. I can't let that eat me alive. And I have all the things or I have these great relationships with my kids. Maybe despite that, maybe because of it, it's, it's that it's just that it's part of the human condition, I think. And it either taking it and like running with it and knowing that I'm better for it versus God, I, this happened to me. And I was married to someone who mm. was terrible to me. Like, you can, and that's why I'm overweight, and that's why I right mm -hmm. be I a victim yeah, and a salty bitch, yeah. or be like, you know what? I'm gonna <laughs> run with this. And this happened. Let me show you. And you know, just a lot of the things you're saying, I'm like, I always try to not head shrink people, but I try to like make sense of behavior and why someone would choose things. And and even just going back to your mom, thinking of you know you gravitating towards your father. I wonder if there was like a you know, this is me being weird, but a sort of this deep seated unconscious thing to be more like your dad. So you got that acceptance from your mom. Like, was your mom crazy about your dad? And if she was, was it something you're like, well, if I'm you know, more like him, point. maybe I, she'll I like me so. and be nice to me. You know what I mean? And because you see that with kids that are abused. I mean, kids that are abused always tend to still want to get that validation from the parent who doesn't see them. Right. And my mother never saw me. And I think that that's a hundred percent spot on. You just have to let go of it. It's when mm -hmm. you see yourself mm -hmm. and then right. that's the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. Cause you can't it's control anybody happy. else. You can't, you and can do the always... dances and be funny and be successful. And your mom is still like, well, I still like your ex-husband or he and I are still very oh, close. Or, like when I started doing comedy, I did comedy for that reason because I didn't have a voice mm -hmm. and comedy for the first time. It was so fucked up after I got divorced. Cause I thought, well, now people are going to see, yeah. they're going to see that he cheated on me in the struggle. Right. I went I'm through. fine. He did this to me or he I'm not did the bad this one to me. I'm not the bad one. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't like that because I said he got the doctor card and he got the gay card. I would literally have people <laughs> that would come up to me. Like it's almost say, a trifecta. <laughs> yes. Oh, 
that must have been so awful for him. Be right. Yeah. And, yeah. That's the trapped right. one. Right. Couldn't Sorry, be Diana. himself. Sorry, Diana. He's the, the, he's the, the trapped one. Yeah. He's right. the trapped one. And then my mind was blown. That was the comedy. <laughs> the comedy let me get up and say, does anybody else think this is screwed up? Because yeah. this is what just happened to me. Do you mind if we actually, if I pick a scab a little bit, just the reason is I, I would venture to guess that there are many listeners it, to this podcast that would may or may not feel stuck themselves. And so when you were in the, the point where you knew you had to start unraveling everything and yet you have these children with this man and you have these, you know, you have a life that you've built, so to speak. However, you know, uh, f however big the facade may be, you still have to do the work of unraveling mm -hmm. that and then going your own way. So how do you, where, where was your mind and your heart in terms of I have to get out of this and I have to break free and I need a clean break and I need to make a new life for myself? Like, where were you in that, in that piece of it? Just because, again, I know there are other women that either feel stuck and don't know the next step. Like, how did you unpack that? So as the, the latter years of the marriage, I, we had seen psychologists and nobody, he was so brilliant, he would outsmart them and it didn't last. Did, so he, admit, lost, did sure. he admit to being gay ever? Well. In therapy or anything? In therapy, but it was like, clearly, if you got arrested, there were lots of multiple incidents and we get, you know, this was the cord telephone in those days. We get hangups all the time, you know, and they'd say is Claude and they'd hear my voice and click, mm, you know, oh so he was, he wasn't admitting to anything because he wanted everything. He wanted me, the perfect, yeah, he know, wanted the Stepford life the and his other life. Yeah. And then this, which brought him excitement and mm. things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. really he had a terrible pathology and I didn't know anything about narcissism. So, ah, <sighs> so selfish. About three years before I realized I couldn't take it anymore. I just wasn't seen. We weren't, I felt, I was in my early 40s. I felt really sexual. You know, I just thought, is no one ever going to slap my ass? Like, is yeah. no one ever going <laughs> to, like, rip my hair? Like, just once. Hinge like, profile. Out. I need an ass slapper. I need <laughs> someone who's straight. Like, here I've been. Someone From that'll undress me with their teeth. Yes, just pour <laughs> no, hot I get candle it. wax. I had all kinds. <laughs> like I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I oh, love it. I had Isn't that so... incredible? How you know God designed our bodies so, so that our sexual awakenings are at such polar different times than men and women. You know what I mean? A man is like at his most virile and is like early 20s or whatever teens and 20s and then it's like we're 35 plus when it happens to us and yeah. then oh it was just it's a sick I joke. was done and yeah. so it's not real but so anyway <laughs> I I started to say what am I gonna you're gonna have to prepare for this this you're not gonna be able to just leave him mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. do you prepare for this yeah so you I gotta get your ducks in a row started seeing attorneys first attorney <laughs> female attorney you know what she said to me and we were at macaroni grill and you know how they give you those crayons to write on yep. the paper? She's talking about, oh, she goes, oh, darling, darling, you haven't made, like a German, a German accent. You haven't made, darling. Why would you leave him? Right. You can do anything you want. Maybe that's what she, you know. Oh, why, yeah. Take why a don't lover. You take, take a lover. lover. Yeah. Take mm -hmm. a lover. Yeah. As if, if I would just snap my fingers like fucking Cinderella and there a lover would appear and I'd have time between the laundry and the kids and everything else sure. to just take that lover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take a lover, darling. And I was writing, because I was listening to her, I was writing on the brown paper and I'm writing, fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. What's yeah. that in German? But, the yeah. world Wait, wasn't, you... fuck you, darling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just with an, with an Probably a <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Greta. So <laughs> I, I just, everywhere I turned, I was just like, what? Right. No help. No help. And then we took up ballroom dancing as if ballroom dancing was my last ditch effort. Mm. This will, this will save the marriage. <laughs> wants me. Yes. It was the beginning 
in like hyperspeed of the end. When I danced with him, you know, I say sometimes the universe has to bitch slap me for me to get the message. Mm -hmm. When I danced with him, he would sweat profusely, I remember. And he danced like a man who wasn't in love. Because when you dance, especially the Spanish dances, oh, sure, yeah, that can be sexy as hell. It's intimate. You know, mm -hmm. he's not into any of this. Mm -hmm. And I got angry. And I finally found an attorney that said, before you do anything, because I saved every penny we had, mm -hmm. every penny we had, I knew where all the money was. He goes, take a big chunk of it because the minute you file, He's coming after you big time and then he'll lock up all the money and my kids were in private school and we had a beautiful house and all of the things. And so I took $200,000 out of our account and he lost his mind yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. and then began the war. He would sue me every two years. It took us two years to get divorced. I started my own business with my divorce assets because I said, it's not, you're not getting any lower than this. So you better like take some of that money and invest in yourself. Mm -hmm. I started doing stand up, and then every two years he would take me back to court. Even so, after your divorce? No, I finally said no mas because I got permanent alimony. Uh -huh. oh. Because I sacrificed everything, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why he sued you to maybe to keep to I think continuing it was just to a fuck with me, and yeah. plus I think he has a thing for me. Mm -hmm. Like I still think I was his possession. Do you know yes. men like that? Yep, I do. I was I the one that said, no mas. Mm -hmm. You don't no quit mas. on him. He makes those decisions. He moves he people into place. Me. Mm -hmm. He it was It was like, who were you this whole time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was craziness. He stole everything in the house that was of worth. One afternoon, he still had keys to the house. And I'm an idiot, right? And he would come in and see the kids and then leave. And... One afternoon I walked in and the kids were watching Steel Magnolias and it's that part where Sally Field is like, you know, why couldn't it be me? Yeah. And, you know, the cemetery. Me yes. Right. Yes. And I'm drawn and I look up and I realize all these beautiful paintings and things are missing off the walls. And he had walked That's in and so took gross. All the chachis, all the Limoges, all the paintings, all the thing. It, it, the pettiness. I think of that woman, and I just hung on, to, you know, like a ship in the storm mm -hmm. for dear life. But with everything that somebody told me I couldn't do, you're not going to be able to start your own ultrasound business. And Watch I went, me. Watch mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. You can't do comedy. You're not funny. You're 50 years old. You know, you can't do that. Watch, Watch me. me do it. Yeah. I am so impressed. So um, when did you start to, I, I realized that all of this is such a beautiful investment in yourself, your business, and then you started investing in your health and your well-being in that way. Tell us about that and the bodybuilding. In, at the end of the, the kind of, in, in between some of the divorce process, someone was, then I'd be the person, because, you know, we grew up in this Cuban kind of Catholic affluent yeah. society if so i then became the person if someone's husband was cheating on them they would come to me oh yeah like mm -hmm. the godmother yeah like to seek advice and mm -hmm. this woman came up to me and she said i think he's cheating he's a sexual addict would you do a bodybuilding competition with me and i, and I was a gym rat so i lived in the gym you know i started mm -hmm. taking up boxing i said yeah and at 47 i won oh my gosh i took I love the whole it. thing Love in it. between being a single mom running my business i just did oh it and God, did it and so difficult to do it was so difficult to do but in those times i was going through menopause my father died and i was coming off this stupid bodybuilding competition and there were no coaches for reversing you out oh wow six I didn't months think later that. i broke my leg i was down to six percent body fat i broke my leg so i think i was a little osteopenic mm -hmm. i developed Hashimoto's mm -hmm. hyperthyroidism, probably from Man. all the inflammation and the cortisol and all the shit, and no one diagnosed it. And I just started on this beginning to believe, oh, but you're 
soon to be 50. This is aging. Menopause. This is just aging. Mm-hmm. This is, yeah. Just get used it's to not. not it, you, yeah. This is just what happens. You're, mm. you're slowly becoming invisible. Mm. Right? Mm. And I bought it. Hook, and when, line, and when your dad died, I'm sure that just was like, because he was the true love of your life, you know, at oh. that point, all the way through. He's just That's such a devastating, you know. Yeah, he was the one that when I started my business, he was the only one. Six months into, I said, Daddy, I'm still in business. Six months. Into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're like, and he goes, most business. He would always have one line he would tell me, and it would just like stay with me. He goes, you know, most businesses fail. If you lasted six months, that's more than he quoted some statistic. Yeah, you're in. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, he was, he was, <sighs> wow. I think my son is a lot like him. I mm. often feel like my son in a way reincarnated some of this mm-hmm. man's spirit. That same the spirit, yeah. The Personality. The sweetness, the, mm-hmm. he's funny. We did stand up together, my son and I. <laughs> really? I love, I love that. that. That's he so was fun. so good. Oh my so gosh. Good. When you wow. first did that, the very, like, what was your fair, very first gig? What did that look like? Oh, it was terrible. Was there like it five people terrible. in the audience and they, you no, know? No, I took a formal course because there wasn't a lot. If you looked back when I how started. Fun. Yeah, how does one so get into almost just doing stand up? Yeah, how does yeah. one get into stand up? Yeah. I started to look for stand up for teaching because mm. I taught ultrasound and I thought, oh, if, I could use some of the stand-up techniques. I'd be even funnier, right? Yeah, that's the best great. Best teacher of all time, absolutely. Right. So Keep everybody I went to engaged. Classes in New York, and then there was there's a performing arts. They had a introduction to stand-up, and I took it. And you got to do it in the small theater, and you took it for twelve weeks. And oh my God. I fell in love and for the first time I would get up on stage and like you talked about what do you do with the anger and all those all those emotions Mm -hmm. because none of us are going to get through these type of experience and tell me you weren't mad as hell all right you weren't mad as hell we're we're doing a podcast to get through our pain (laughs) It's therapy. But I, that's what that's we're doing. True. It is. It's, it is. And to mm-hmm. know that other women got really mad as hell. And when I got up on stage, no one told me to not be loud. Mm-hmm. I could be loud. I could say whatever I want. I could curse. Because mm-hmm. as a good Catholic girl, we didn't curse either. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All I wanted to say was, fuck, fuck. I, <laughs> I wanted to say it so All much on long. stage. <laughs> not because it served any purpose in it, right. but there was something so freeing of, for yeah. a woman that just kind of let that go. And I was dating a guy from California, Hawaii, and I really liked him. And he, I thought he was a nice guy, but he broke up with me via email. Ew. And in the email, he signed it, his business signature, Aloha. <laughs> and I was so pissed. That was is like, fodder for that? comedy if I've ever seen it. <laughs> right. And he had a little, little penis. Oh, what a shame. And I went. You're okay. breaking up with me? <laughs> what are you no. talking about? Come on. And the whole world is going to know now that you have a You're little penis. You're packing a tootsie penis. roll, buddy. Like... <laughs> and so I had friends. It was the worst routine. I had friends take a bottle oh. of cornichon, the little French pickles. Oh. Uh-huh. And at some key moment in my stand-up, I say to the audience, well, he had a small penis. How small? I go, now it's your turn to say, how small was it? And then she walks up with this fucking bottle of cornichon. <laughs> <laughs> Baby pickles. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. You're like, it's a sweet gherkin. It's just a little guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh so God. the first ones, and then I started putting my mother in the act because I went to New yeah. York the first time and I'm performing at the Gotham. It's a big deal. I'm in the taxi and deal. this was the beginning of using her. She called and she'd never say hello. She'd just go, so sad. She talks just like that. Where are you? <laughs> and I'm going, I'm in New York. I, like an Italian, mother, right? not New York. They're going to kill you and rape you and pillage you and leave you dead and dying in a gutter. And I'm like, mom, I haven't 
haven't dated in a while, so that sounds good. Yeah, that's okay. Well, that's that's exciting, that might work. Actually. Yeah. And um, I said, I'm actually getting ready to do my, I'm going to perform. I'm going to do stand up. Why? You're not doing that comedy shit. You're not funny. <laughs> Screaming at me. You're not funny right before I'm walking on. She goes, and I bet you're going to tell them about me. And if you do, I want a commission. And she hangs up the fucking phone. And I opened and it killed. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh. Awesome. And I realized. Did that you call her back and you'll say, and you said, I'll send you your <laughs> oh, 25 cents? Oh, I tell cents. her all the time. She's <laughs> never seen me perform. Yeah. Never seen me perform. That's but. not a shock. And, and I found myself healing myself with more of the traumas of her, mm -hmm. you know, through this. And it was from the silver tooth. That, wow. To telling me about my period. Oh, no. Oh, no. All no. women were cursed. And now you. Oh, God. And I said, well, I want to get. Now, here's this box of Kotex. Remember Kotex back at the yep. adult? Because you're too young. Yeah. No, they no, were I like do. fucking adult diapers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They sat literally separated your thighs. You had to wrap mm -hmm. them up in a garden. A, what you, about the, the belt and the whole. Yeah, I mean, the I belt didn't... that caught up in your. Because nobody shaved yeah. in those days. So it right. caught up in your. And I said, Mama, Cynthia Garcia uses tampons. I, tampons will make your hole big. <laughs> and then for the first time you go, wait, I didn't, is there a hole? No one said anything about a hole. No one's talking about that. <laughs> wait, what? That, that's you very have to go similar. to medical school to get that right, information. To understand. <laughs> but that, I got a lot of that from my mother, not but in a way that because her mother told her nothing, you know, my mom wanting, I want to shave my legs. And my mom or my grandmother said, you're too short. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> you can't shave your legs. You're too short. And my mom was very logical and asked yeah. all the questions. And she was just like, what? But it, it, but I knew a lot of, I knew everything as a kid, especially having two older brothers. But my mom was very open that way because her mother was not. And she would, she was adamant about saying, you know, if you have questions and she would draw, you know, the ovaries and what the uterus looked like was very just like, if you have questions, you know, and so I've tried to be that way for my kids just to be like, you know, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'll answer the questions that you have. And I, you know, in a logical manner, not clinical so much, you know, with, with a little bit of sass and humor, but just to answer questions so that they're not like, oh, wait, what? Does, what is that? How you know, well, boys should know that too, right? Right. Without you, you know, right. So you might as well prepare them to not have that. Absolutely. Moment and <laughs> the right. misunderstanding, because people still. I'm amazed at how women, especially now, men, I think, don't really understand women's bodies, and they're not always interested in it. They're more just interested in what it can do for them, which is fine. Like men are just much more simpler, and that's not a dig on men. I love men. Don't get me wrong. But I think they're also not taught. But as girls and women, like you, you should know when you're ovulating, what your body's doing. Your body tells you what it's doing. And women, mm -hmm. I'm 51, and I know people that are like, "Wait, what?" Mm -hmm. Like, well, yeah, it's on yeah. this day. Cycle and if you feel and your your mood, cycle it tracking blows and your energy levels, my cycle mind. tracking and your your ability to have like output when you can take on more stress when you can't when you you know when to kind of love yourself in the in the midst of that Just cycle. I've this learned, menopausal I'm learning that now, and I don't even have a period anymore. Well, so. the menopausal thing is, I think it's it's a whole new world, but it it's just everyday stuff. You're like, oh, I wonder. You feel a ping or a ting. I'm just. I try to be super in tune with that. I'm not feeling myself. I, what did I eat yesterday? Have I been sleeping? Like even some things as simple as that where people haven't really talked about that, I think, in the past. Yeah. But just the basic day-to-day, -day, this is what my body's doing. This is what do I have, you know, fluid <laughs> emitting from my, you know, body in some different orifices coming out. And what does that you mean? Should, do, right. Is yeah. it abnormal? You right. Know? And people, yeah. if there's a different smell, if there's like, it's just, you should know that. And most women my age do not know that. I, and I'm shocked on a regular basis. I'm like, how do you not? Well, I don't mm -hmm. open a book. Like now there's more information than I ever. Think, so I anyway. Think the biohacking movement that we're seeing now and that mm -hmm. verbiage coming alive a little bit more is actually 
paving some runway for these types of conversations to happen about like cycle right. tracking and what is actually going on in your body when you have these surges of testosterone in your cycle and like what that does to you and your ability to sleep or your ability to work out harder or, or sure. not or when you're in that declining phase whatever i think that's really really amazing and some i have a 13 year old daughter so i'm like i i wish i knew these things you know yes and that's why i started teaching it and i think again <laughs> this experience with my mother like your mother with her grandmother just said and i remember as a young woman saying if i ever have little girls i never want them to feel this shame yeah. right. associated with this because my mother would say things like those You're cortex cursed. when you rolled them up right they were like big cotton <laughs> bale things mm -hmm. in the trash can. And we only had one bathroom we could put them in. And she would scream at us say, never let your father see it. I'm like, what? he has three girls. Like never right. do we want to like shame the girls into something that. Your body's doing about. this automatically. Yes. Why should I feel bad about it? Correct. You know? Yeah. Correct. Yes. But again, and your mom sounds like a, a terrible person, no offense, but. I think that she came from a different time also. She, her yeah. mother probably, so I think- No, her mother died early. She was raised in a Cuban Catholic convent. So, so I mean, there's some- you know, yeah, lots yeah, of shame exactly. there, I'm sure. So she probably just didn't know instead, but instead of saying, you know what, I don't know, let me, let me find out more. So there's the, always that shut down kind of, we're just not gonna talk about it. And when we do, I'm gonna make you feel really shitty about it because you're a bad person if you're curious about what your body's doing. Yeah. Your mother had yeah, children. We know what your body was doing. Right. Yeah. And it's, come on, you know, we know you, we did it at least a couple times. So it, it it's interesting how it, the pendulum has definitely swung maybe a little oh, too far, not. you know, but yeah. you know, there's a little bit, I think a, a yeah. lot of information that tends to be misinformation out there, yeah. but like there's you said, there's so of, much, there's a lot of pussy power now. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm curious what the, I would love to just touch a little bit on like dating post divorce and what that story has been for you. And are you dating now? Are you I'm not dating in now? A okay. Um, goodness, it's on my vision board. I, you know, I, I, um, yeah. Is it something that you want for yourself? Do you see? Do you do you close I'm your eyes and picture yourself having a partner? Work. I do. I I often say he's coming, but. One of the things that I found, so as soon as I got divorced, I dated a younger man. I, I highly recommend that <laughs> for a short period of time. I really feel like- You were making up for lost time. You were like, give me all the that testosterone. Was, that was wonderful though, to yeah. kind of mm -hmm. take- Did he have ownership. kids? He had one little boy and it wasn't great. I mean, it was probably- stepping into one dysfunction into another, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, looking back at it. It's such but a minefield it, dating after divorce because it's like you want to be with someone that has children because you have to have them understand your priorities. It, if, if you're dating somebody and you have kids and they don't have kids, then there's just a, they don't have an understanding of what the your time and the commitment. Be. And, yeah. Exactly. Um, but, you know, even if you, ha we all have so much baggage at that point, it's like you can have you can have the greatest guy in the whole wide world, but his kids may hate you. Or he might be amazing, but he's got a crazy ex-spouse who's going to make your life a living hell. Miserable. So there's always mm -hmm. these, like, many, 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 many things. The, but you, know. you walk into it, and I don't know if you guys can relate to this, you walk into this and you're in love. Mm -hmm. Like, you're in love. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't remember. There was no drug that felt like this attraction that I had yeah. until I started to unpeel the layers and go, oh, oh no, I'm looking at this like when I was 17, you know, mm -hmm. you're my new love and you're younger and we'll live. And, mm. and then all of a sudden you're like, but that doesn't align with me and you're an alcoholic and mm. you're this and you're that. And so that experience, I still am grateful for it. it, yeah. it mm -hmm. the, the sexuality component for it, I'm so grateful. Yeah. Um, and then I dated a few men, and then I had the business of raising my son by myself. Mm -hmm. And he was slow, uh, rapidly approaching high school. And I remember someone saying to me, 
Now you can leave him alone. He doesn't need you as much. And I remember thinking, now is when he needs me. Mm -hmm. The most. The most. Mm -hmm. And that must have been what my journey was going to be about because it became him. And I would occasionally date a man and they would, I was financially okay, I was smart, I was good looking. And then all of a sudden, and this could have been my own mindset, but I just felt like I had to be needy to be in a relationship again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I wasn't needy. I had a job to do. I had to yeah. raise this boy. And somebody said, oh, well, you like spending time more with him. And I said, a, a thousand percent. A thousand percent. I get one shot at this. And he's all mine. Like, mm -hmm. my ex-husband was not involved. So I think that that set the stage for me being okay with single because yeah, yeah. when I lost the weight I would hear people say you know what you need now hot sex on a plate well oh, that man. would be great that you know what what would complete this picture is if you had a man mm -hmm. now if you had a man if you had a man right if you had a man you're like and you'd be able to show advice. your you know beautiful yeah, then it, thin self and honestly ladies it's going to happen, probably. Well, it, whether it'll be just sex again, which I would not turn down in a heart, you know, if it was safe, right? But, right. but whatever it is, it's going to happen. And I, yeah. I'm kind of really leaving it to the universe because I will tell you, I've never been happier in my own skin. Ever, 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 ever. I like me. Mm. I like being alone with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. I like Katie's me. heard I this a million me. times from me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm I like, like I'm good. I'm, good. I'm funny. I'm smart. I'm I make gay. me laugh. And you don't need I a damn thing from a anybody. Band. I have a good job. I'm financially, I, I speak four languages. Yep. I'm a fucking badass. Yes. And if God chooses that he's going to put a man to match me and mm -hmm. see that and honor that and, and say, elevate oh my that. God. And elevate that, right? Right. Make it then even better. Yes. And if he doesn't, I still wake up tomorrow morning and go, I like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like the work you're doing. I like that you're setting the stage. Because, you know, in the menopausal world, like you said, it's a very lucrative world. But it's still a world. How can I ask your age, Karen? I'm 51. So you guys are like, that's that market. Mm -hmm. But what we see it sort of exponentially drop off is now in the 60 something market. Mm -hmm. Like that still isn't as represented as I want it to be. Most know? definitely. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel like I'm the bell ringer for. Mm -hmm. You know, this is 67 and I'm doing, I'm doing a live on Thursday with a fellow young woman who's now a coach. Who, do you know Caroline Drury? Do you follow her? I've heard She's of her, yes. Kiki. Just from Kiki, She's yes. She's just a bright light, yes. young woman. And we're doing this thing called the Thousand Day Project. And she was the one who inspired me because I realized in a thousand days, I'll be 70. Wow. And I wanted to see what is 70, if this is good right now. What does it have in store for you? Yes. What is 70 even? better, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the best 70 you can be. I love that and mindset. So I, I don't think like that. <laughs> no, Karen I don't think like, like just I put didn't. me out to pasture. Let me get through today. Boom, 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 boom. You know, like this I'm is not good for Karen to hear. But 70, <laughs> like in your head, try and imagine in a thousand days, that number seven, there was something that just it clicked. was like, how do I stay in my lane? Because what does Jane Fonda call this period of life, our third act? It used to be considered an arc to age. Mm -hmm. So you went up and then you went down. She calls it an ascension. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's like 90. Yeah, she almost I, I is. I think she's like 90, 89 or 90. So, I mean, she's, yeah. And I think if we think of it like that, but again, you, 
you look at what we have around us and our parents and our grandparents and how they lived and sort of that slowing down and okay, because naturally, you you know, you get tired a little bit earlier and, but I think that you don't have to. And so I think I see so many women just in the 67 ish and amplifying. Right. It's like, why do I have to slow down? I can start a new career. I can start a new career at 65 or 67. My whole life for this. What if this was the time that this was supposed to happen? Mm -hmm. I could have done it before, but I chose not to. But what if I'm choosing at this age not to be, and I love my grandkids, don't get me wrong. I don't want to be a full-time grandparent. I don't, I don't, if I have to, if they need me, but. But you know, inside you have a lot to offer still that you have to get done. I feel like. You know, there's a, there's a feeling that is just propelling you that I, I have more to offer. Still more to do, I would assume. Yeah. It just doesn't feel like, because I think we get 70 in the head and it's like, uh, uh. No, 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 Mm -hmm. no. What does Gloria Steinem say about, and then a silver, you know, haired group of warrior women will take silently take over the world. And that's what I visualize. Probably Mm. going to happen. Mm. (laughs) I, I fight. Because the guys are scratching their bellies and you know, like Like they've had their turn. It's our turn. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We'll just keep shit running. I love you guys so much. This oh is so Oh my goodness. Fun. Thank you so much. Okay, so one of the things that we always ask, and this is just me personally, um, you know, m- how we show up in the world is so critical in terms of how we dress, our makeup, our clothing, our, and Karen and I are big fashion people, and obviously I'm in the makeup business, so I am always asking myself these three questions. How do you want to be seen? How do you want to be heard? And what do you want to leave them with? And so I want to pose that question to you is, what do you want to leave people with today um, that says like that, uh, something about you? Not to be scared you? of this or the number or mm-hmm. that there's such a wisdom that comes from your trials and your happiness Mm -hmm. and your early years that if you could just go back to that and explore that and say what did i dream about and know that it isn't over until it's over Mm -hmm. but that self-love if a woman can learn the habits of self-love and i say this over and over again and this is my biggest lesson is that when i learned to love myself first keep the promises of myself and love myself, right? The world just became a better place. It was so much easier to love everybody else Mm -hmm. because I, for the first time, learned no is a sentence, a complete sentence. (laughs) Period. And I really like me. Yeah. And that's why I did things like this. Because you just don't need anything more at that point. You know, you're not seeking anything. You're not looking for any kind of external validation. You just, you are so good at, at just lo- being great with you that and no, there's everything room else for all is just an icing on the mm-hmm. cake. But well, you know, I don't have to fight with you. I don't have to be more beautiful. Not than you. in competition. Dress better. Or it's not a competition. It's, mm-hmm. There's room for all of us. And if there isn't, I bring up my own folding chair. And there we go. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I oh love that. Oh my gosh. Susan, love you that. are so <laughs> delicious. I had the best, best, best Me time. Me too. I could have like, we could have got you. pajamas and, yeah. you know. That's usually how we're like, okay, what else? Do we need wine? What else are we, we going to talk about? How can we oh, are how, going how much to have you have? back on the show? I can tell you that much. Um, For sure. Uh, but good luck with your thousand day uh, project. project. I, I can't wait to maybe we'll have you on again when you're in the midst of all of that and feeling all the feels and exploring what's there. Um, that's super exciting. But again, just massive gratitude to you for sharing your history, your relationship history, your career history, and just yourself and your vivacious self. We're just so grateful to have you. So thank you so much. Well, the same here, it's ditto for Uh, both of you. uh, I've been, like I said, Katie, I've been fangirling for a long time. Oh gosh. She's easy to like. I took a chance. Yes. Yes. You too, Karen, though. Yeah, I'm I'm just here. (laughs) No, stop it. You stop it right now. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.